when I first found out that I was going to study Arabic in Jordan on a government scholarship, I was really excited, but I was also a little bit apprehensive because back then I'd see headlines on newspapers about protests spreading across the Middle East, and I wasn't really sure what I was getting myself into. So before I sent out that email that went, oh, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity, exclamation point, I decided that I'd give myself just one goal, and that was basically just to observe as much as possible. Actually, I also had another goal, which was to be able to read an Arabic newspaper front to back by the time I came back, but that didn't end up happening. <laughs> I can probably decipher three to five words without a dictionary. <laughs> uh, so Jordan is a really beautiful and fascinating place, and I wanted to share with you some observations I made while I was there. If you make an appointment to meet with a Jordanian around yani 2 p.m., you can expect anywhere between a 20-minute to three-hour delay. Part of this is cultural, and another part of it is that traffic there is really horrible. I have really fond memories of myself trying to flag a taxi on my way back from school. It would take me at least one hour to catch a taxi driver's attention, and then I'd have to sort of fight with the other Jordanians who also wanted to get home in time for lunch. And if the taxi driver didn't like the destination I wanted to go to, he'd speed off with another passenger and I'd be stuck waving my hand for the next 20 minutes. Uh, this here is a popular cafe in Rainbow Street. Uh, family is a big part of Jordanian culture, and you'll often see uh, families relaxing by smoking water pipes together inside or outside of the house. And water scarcity is a really big issue. Um, as you can see in the convenient red circle I made for you, um, <laughs> Jordanians usually rely on water trucks to come refill uh, their water tanks about once every week. And um, if you don't, uh, if you're not able to conserve your water until that time, you might have to rough it out for a bit. Vegetarian, what do I mean by that? Vegetarians are also something that are very scarce in Jordan. So by, if you've spent enough time there, you'll probably be converted into this mentality that dujaj, or chicken, isn't actually a form of meat. <laughs> so one day when I was coming home from school, uh, I saw a bunch of people with banners and pictures of the king, and I was really excited because I thought this might be some festival that I was missing out on, so I wanted to get out and join them. And then I found out that it was a protest. Uh, and I, talked, I turned over to the Jordanian who I was talking to before, and I asked, aren't you scared? And he looked at me kind of funny, and he went, no, it's protest Friday. Don't you have this in America? <laughs> and I said, no. And it was really interesting because it seemed like it was a bigger deal for me than it was for him. <laughs> but what struck me the most about Jordan, though, was how pervasive American culture is there. If you turn on the radio, you'll probably hear the latest pop song from Lady Gaga or Katy Perry. And if you turn on the TV, you'll see uh, a rerun of Home Alone 2 or an Arabic dubbed version of SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> um, most children there start learning English when they're in elementary school and many of the Jordanians I met were fluent in English. When I got lost in Amman, which happened many, many times, I was able to figure my way around, not because I was really good at Arabic, but more because all of the signs and all of the uh, highway directions were written in both Arabic and English. And it wasn't that hard for me to stumble across uh, maybe a McDonald's, a Starbucks, or a Popeye's when I was wandering around. So it became clear to me pretty quickly that my knowledge of Jordanian culture and Arab culture in general was pretty small in comparison to how much the typical Jordanian knew about Americans. Which brings me to an awkward moment I'd like to share with you. Uh, at one point during the trip, I and some other students were invited to the Jordanian Institute of Diplomacy. And about halfway through the meeting, one man stood up and said to us, so I'm really honored that you want to learn more about my country, but I have to ask you, what, did, what steps did you guys take to learn more about Arab culture before you guys came here? Awkward silence. And then finally, some brave students raised their hands and said, I ate at Middle Eastern restaurants, or <laughs> I listened to some Arabic rap music on YouTube. And after a while, the man glanced at us. This was a future diplomat. And he said, I don't mean to be rude, but it seems to me that your knowledge of my culture is kind of shallow. 
So this was a really embarrassing experience, but it made me realize two things. First, it made me realize that I had resources in New York that I hadn't been utilizing until then. And it also demonstrated to me how easy it is to isolate yourself from other cultures, even when they're right in front of you. Now that I'm back in New York, I think I've become a little bit more aware of some misperceptions of Arab culture caused by this distance. Uh, for example, several people asked me uh, some variation of, so how did the Arabs treat you when they found out you're a Christian? Did they try to convert you? And I think this question suggests several things that aren't necessarily true, uh, starting with the assumption that all Arabs are Muslim. So here are some pictures of churches in Amman uh, going clockwise. That's Greek Orthodox, Catholic, Coptic, and Baptist. Um, Christians make about 6% of the population. Most of the Muslims who I met there were eager to dispel what they thought were common American stereotypes of Islam, such as the idea that Islam condones or even supports terrorism. And they were really anxious to stress to me that Islam is inherently a religion of peace and that they shouldn't be associated with the actions of some radical individuals. Okay. And there are a lot of things that I wish I could share with you, but I'm running out of time. So I hope this gives you a jumping point for you to start learning on your own. I know I have a lot of things that I need to learn, and I think it's going to take a while for three reasons. First is that I feel like I was only able to experience one part of Jordan's culture. Like I said before, I spent most of my time studying in Western Amman, and that's the more cosmopolitan and more westernized part of the area. And in the same way that New York can't be said to represent the culture of all of America, you can't really say that Amman is like the average norm for all of Jordan. Second, a lot of the things that I learned came from breaking unspoken rules. For example, I now know I'm not supposed to sit in the front of a taxi because I tried doing that one time and the driver kindly shooed me out and told me that that seat is reserved for female relatives. And third, it's not always, the reasons for what I observed aren't always apparent to me until much, much later. Uh, for example, the significance of protests usually being uh, held on Fridays wasn't apparent to me until I got home and connected Friday, day of communal prayer with Friday, mass gatherings. So I had a great time studying in Jordan and I definitely want to return and if I had to give myself a new goal before I return, it would be to step out of my comfort zone a bit and to do less observing and some more questioning. I think in light of the historic events that have been happening in January and continue till this day, it's important to examine how we perceive other societies and also consider how these perceptions can eventually become culturally ingrained. So I think it's important that this be an individual process, and I hope you'll, enjoy, you'll join me in exploring the world, and it'll be worth it. It'll be a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you.